Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Module 4 of Week 3. That's 3.4, I guess. Now, what we did in Module 3 was we kind of completed the development of what you could call the point channel model. That is what we showed was that if you take the expression for current that we had earlier in the course, but then include this self-consistent potential u, this potential of the channel u into it, and this u then has to be calculated self-consistently from these two equations, then what you could do is use this set of equations to provide a reasonably good description of the current voltage characteristics of small devices. And I guess the homework problems, the first few homework problems are in this week, kind of illustrate how you might want to use this. And those are things that are discussed further in the tutorial. Now what I'd like to do in this module is tell you a little more on how to go beyond this I guess the point channel model. Now why do I call it a point channel model? Well, because it thinks of the entire channel, you know, the thing that connects the source and the drain. It thinks of that entire channel as just one point, you know, which has a certain potential U. Whereas in practice, the way you should think about it is, well, this channel is a continuous thing. So that potential is changing continuously, you see? So when you look at the channel, it's not like there is a single number here that will describe the, pro the entire channel. It's more like you should view this as a continuous axis Z, and this is like U of Z. Okay? And now if you do that, of course the equation gets a little more complicated now. You know, one of the nice things so far was the equations were relatively I'd say straightforward. We didn't really have a differential equation. Whereas once you take a, this variation along the channel into account, you'd need a, what you might call a differential equation. So let me show how that would come about. You could take this expression for current that we had, let's say, and write this u in the following form, that i is equal to is exactly what I had before. Times So let me explain what I did here. What we're doing now is we're thinking of this long channel, you see, here, as being composed of lots of little pieces. So this part is say Z, this is Z plus delta Z. And we are applying our formula that we had into to this region, right? Now, so that's why the G has, is now shifted by whatever the potential is appropriate at that point. That's the U of C, see? And this, instead of F1 minus F2, which are like the Fermi functions on the two sides, we now have the F at this point and the F at this point. So F at Z, and f at z plus delta z. Now, in general, of course, these functions do not need to be Fermi functions because Fermi function is a property of something at equilibrium. And usually what one assumes is that when you, in a device, the contacts, the source and the drain, those are big regions which always remain in equilibrium. On the other hand, if you look inside the channel, that can be very far from equilibrium. Because after all, you got these two contacts trying to dictate two different types of equilibrium, and so it does something in between. So this middle region usually is way out of equilibrium. 
And so usually these things would not be equilibrium Fermi functions. But in what is often assumed, and this usually in many devices is a good ap approximation, is to assume that, the fir that this distribution f of z, the, 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 the f at z the actual distribution of electrons in energy, I guess I should have written this as f of e comma z, so it's like I'm standing at a point z and I'm asking how are the electrons distributed in energy. This can be approximately represented as something that looks just like a Fermi function, but with a specific electrochemical potential mu of z over kt plus 1. So you see, if I was in the contact, the distribution of electrons in energy would have looked like this with mu 1 over there, if I was in contact 1. If I was in contact 2, it would look like mu 2, that's drain. And if you are somewhere in between, the assumption is the distribution of electrons in energy can be described by some effective electrochemical potential mu. Right? I guess people call this quasi-Fermi levels. Quasi-Fermi level in the sense that you really have this Fermi level and this Fermi distribution only if a region is completely in equilibrium. But here we are talking of something that's really not quite at in equilibrium, and we'll talk about this a little more even in the next module as we go on. But often the assumption you make is that you can represent it this way, where this mu is, like it's quasi-Fermi level, let's say. So if you make that assumption, then you see, as we did before, if you remember, we took F1 minus F2 and replaced it with minus del F0 del E, where F0 was like the Fermi function that was like the average between 1 and 2, took that, and then multiplied by mu1 minus mu2, you know, which was QV. This is what we had done earlier. Now, this time also we can do something similar as long as this assumption is true. So if that's true, what I could do is the following. We'll write, we'll approximate this with minus del F del E at the location Z. I mean, as you remember, I mentioned this really is function of E comma Z, although I didn't write that explicitly, and this is E comma Z plus delta Z. Okay. So this is del F del E at at that location times the difference between mu, the electrochemical potential at Z, and the electrochemical potential at Z plus delta Z. So you have mu of z minus mu of z plus delta z. Okay. So you could write it this way. Now, this conductance, as you know, what we have discussed before, is given by the conductivity Take this off. The conductivity times the cross sectional area. I'll just write A. If it's a two dimensional conductor, you should use the width W. If it's a one dimension, you don't need that. But I'm just generally writing A. Now divided by the length, but one of the things we have seen is in this new Ohm's law, it's not just proportional to length, it's actually like delta z plus the mean free path. So delta z is the length of the section plus mean free path. Now this is where there is something subtle involved and that is, you see one of the points that I explained earlier is that this extra resistance that you see, you know, this new Ohm's law, that really is associated with the interfaces. So what that means is when we are trying to write the conductance of a section like this, 
we should not really include the interface resistance because we have an interface resistance here where a narrow region suddenly becomes wide. You have an interface resistance here, but there is really no interface here. So there should not be any interface resistance associated with it either. And so when you are trying to use this equation to describe something inside the channel, we should not include the interface part of it. So you should use just something like this. So if you take that, then you see you can write I divided by A, that's current per unit area or in two dimension would be current per unit width. We pull that out. And then you'd have one over Q integral DE sigma E minus UZ minus del F del E at Z times this mu of Z minus mu of Z plus delta Z divided by delta Z. Okay. Now, this is the quantity that you could call the effective conductivity at the point Z because so you're integrating over energy. So finally you get a number that doesn't depend on energy anymore. It's one number, but the number you get now could be changing from one point in the channel to another. It could actually be varying with Z. So that's the sigma of Z. See now, and what we have there, this is the thing that as delta Z tends to zero, you could write as d mu dz with a negative sign because it's z and then this is z plus delta z. But this then would be like minus d mu dz. So you see overall then what we get is the following. Let me write this up here. So, So the current is proportion current per unit area. It depends on this derivative of this electrochemical potential or the quasi Fermi level times this conductivity, which could be varying with Z. And the way you find the conductivity is what you have written here. So let me just write that definition down here. So this is sigma Z. So that's the basic equation then. So how would you so apply this to a particular problem? Well, when you so you'd actually first try to find how this chemical potential mu varies with Z across the device. And in a one dimensional situation, we could say that, you see, this is the current at a particular location in Z, but then in a one dimensional device, you must have the same current everywhere. So whatever current's flowing here or here or here, anywhere down, it must be the same because it's sort of like cars, you know, things going down smoothly. And if at this end, you have a lot more electrons coming in, let's say 100 come in and only 50 get out, then of course, in between, the number of electrons will keep building up with time. So in order to have a steady state situation, the number coming in at any point must be equal to the number coming in, you know, coming out of that region anywhere else. So I must be independent of Z. So usually you could write di dz is equal to zero. So this is the set of equations that one would use, you see, to analyze a longer device. You know, the one with the 
to where you go beyond the point channel model. And the key point though is that in getting from here to here inside the channel, I ignored this interface resistance associated with these points because the interface resistance only would appear at the ends. But then if you are going to use it in a real device, in a short device, it is important to include the interface resistances at the ends. And that is the part we'll talk a little more about in the next module. But in this module, I just wanted to give you a feeling for how normally people analyze you know, longer devices without making this point channel approximation. They would use an equation that looks something like this, see? And also, they would have equivalent equations, extensions of these two equations, which I won't be going into because what we have here, what's written here, that's like the point channel version of the, what's called the Poisson equation of electrostatics. So there is an Poisson, there's a differential equation, again, it's in your notes, I'm not going into it, which relates the potential U to the electron density as it varies along the channel. So in the point channel model, of course, number of electrons is one number, potential is one number. In the full Poisson equation, this is something that changes with Z, that's also that changes with Z, and they're related by a differential equation, and that's the Poisson equation. And similarly, there would be a version of this, which would tell you the electron density at any point Z, how it varies, with z, and this d would be something that would be changing with z, just as this Fermi functions, the distributions change with z. So that is what you'd have to do to analyze the devices, you know, to go beyond the point channel model, which is kind of beyond the scope of this course. I just wanted to give you a feeling for how that connects up to that. And one of the important points I also want to make is this two types of potentials that enter this discussion, these two concepts, you see. One is mu and the other is this u, see. So u is like energy, this has to do with this electrostatic potential, what you might call the electrostatic potential. So if in a certain region the electrostatic potential is positive, that corresponds to a negative U, as we have discussed. It moves all the density of states up and down. On the other hand, this mu is a, I guess one should mention is an approximate concept, which describes that if you have a whole bunch of states, roughly up to how, what level is it filled? So if you talk about a mu inside a device, it gives you a feeling for where it, up to what level it's filled. Whereas what the U does is it just moves this whole thing up and down. As I mentioned, if you had a positive U, this thing would rise up. Whereas if you had a negative U, it would go lower. So U lower moves this up and down, while mu gives you a feeling for roughly where it is filled. And that's very important because as you know, the actual effective conductivity gets weighted by this derivative of the distribution function, and that, as you know, is has a peak right around the mu. So finally, what matters is the conductivity right around the mu after it has, of course, been moved by the U. So this electrostatic potential and the electrochemical potential, those are two things that one should be clear on. And one point I'd like to mention again is that finally the current really depends on the slope of the electrochemical potential. And sometimes in the usual literature, the way people think of it is, it is usually divided into two parts. You see, the sigma d mu dz, you'd write it as sigma d mu minus u dz minus du dz. I guess I could just pull the minus out here. Don't have to. So sometimes, I guess this d mu dz, you could write it separately as mu minus u and u. So this is what you call the electrochemical potential. This would be more like the electrostatic potential. And this is what you might call the chemical potential. And 
Sometimes it's convenient to think of the current as having these two parts to it. One part that depends on the slope of the electrostatic potential and some that depends on this chemical potential. This part is, is representative of the actual electron de density because it's like mu tells you up to what level it is filled and u tells you how much it moved up. So mu minus u is a good measure of how many, uh, what, what states are filled up. So it's a good measure of the electron density. And so often this is what's called the drift current. So that's like the electric field. This is how the electrostatic potential changes in space. The slope is the electric field and this is the drift. And this is what people refer to as diffusion. And so there is often people refer to it as the drift diffusion equation. And often, and sometimes it's quite convenient to divide it that way. And as I said, this is quite common in the semiconductor device literature. But the point I want to stress though is that this is really more fundamental in the sense that current really depends on the slope of the electrochemical potential. So if you are analyzing complicated things where the density of states varies spatially, the effective mass is changing spatially, you're going from one medium to another, the relation that is fundamental is more like that current will, it depends on the slope of the electrochemical potential. You know, just as heat flow is determined by the slope on temperature, current depends on electrochemical potential. Whereas this division into drift and diffusion is, is relatively arbitrary. What I mean is if you had a complicated material, there may be some additional terms that depend on the slope of how fast the effective mass changes. This is really the relation you can always count on and everything else is sort of derived from it. So this then would be like the extended channel version. You could get an equation like this from here. But of course, the part that I've glossed over and that is what we'll talk over, talk about in the next module is if you are using this equation, how would you include this interface resistance, you know, which has been at the core of a lot of our discussion in the last two weeks. As I said, the main new thing we have learned in nanoelectronics in this context is this additional interface resistance that enters into Ohm's law. And how would you modify this equation or use this equation so that you can include that into our thinking? That's what we'll go into in the next module.